All right, if we could uh, begin reading, please, in the book of Judges once more, and uh, we're down to chapter 12 and verse 4, and we'll read till the end of the chapter. And so chapter 12, verse 4, it says, Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and taught the Ephraimite, uh, <coughs> sorry, and fought with Ephraim. <laughs> Sorry, the light's not so good here. Fought with Ephraim, and the men of Gilead smote Ephraim, because they said, ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, let me go over that the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said nay, then said they unto him, Say now Shibboleth. And he said Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. And Jephthah judged Israel six years, then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. And after him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. And he had 30 sons and 30 daughters whom he sent abroad and took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then died Ibzan and was buried at Bethlehem. And after him, Elon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel, and he judged Israel ten years. And Elon, the Zebulonite, died and was buried in Ijalon in the country of Zebulun. And after him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, a Pirathonite, judged Israel. And he had forty sons and thirty nephews that rode on threescore and ten ass colts, and he judged Israel eight years. And Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirathonite died and was buried in Pirathon in the land of Ephraim in the Mount of the Amalekites. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word to us. Some have suggested that this uh, particular chapter should be uh, called Speak Clearly or Be Careful How You Speak because it's all down to pronunciation and a mispronunciation would cost you your life. Apparently, during the Second World War, the Germans uh, asked uh, Russian uh, people how to pronounce corn, uh, the, the word corn that we would normally use. And apparently, Russian Jews pronounced it differently to the normal Russian citizen. And as they pronounced corn, uh, that signaled their, their death basically. And so amazing how uh, sometimes language and just how a man pronounces something can have significant effect. And certainly we're going to see that in this chapter. Now, of course, we've, we saw last time that Ephraim have a great history of being touchy brethren. And they always seem to show up after the battle is over and feel like they should have been included and should have been in the center of the activity. And so we've seen it with Gideon, how he uh, took the approach of a, a, a soft answer turns away wrath. And, and certainly that was a good, a good thing that he did and uh, <clears throat> was able to pacify them for a time. Uh, but here they are again, back to their old tricks. And I wanna just look at a verse in Proverbs chapter 17, because I thought it was kind of interesting because of, of strife, how difficult it is uh, to deal with strife. And certainly the Ephraimites uh, were men who loved contention. They loved strife. They're, they're always in the thick of it, it seems, in the book of Judges, uh, showing up at the wrong time, showing up with the intent of causing strife and division. And Proverbs 17 and verse, verse 14, it just simply says this, it says, the beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water, therefore leave off contention before it, it be uh, meddled with. And the thought is that, you know, once water kind of escapes, it's hard to get it back again. It's hard to stop it. And so same with strife. Once it starts, it's hard to stop it and it's hard to put things back together again. 
And because the, the Ephraimites uh, were constantly creating strife, they, they were just uh, difficult brethren. Um, this time, Jephthah does not use a soft answer. Uh, in fact, he teaches them a lesson that would, in a sense, cure Ephraim. Uh, we're not going to hear much of them causing trouble from now on inwards. And uh, it was, in a sense, maybe it was time that somebody dealt with Ephraim, uh, called their bluff, taught them a lesson. And so the time had come, and they had to learn that their proud, divisive, selfish, demoralizing, destructive spirit would not be tolerated any longer. And Jephthah's approach, though, was administered with his usual thoroughness. And he's, he definitely is very thorough. He was thorough in the way he dealt uh, with the enemy. Uh, and now he's just as thorough as he deals with the people of God. And so he's going to use thoroughness, zeal, and be harsh in the extreme. And the result is going to be uh, that Ephraim will not be a, of military significance uh, for a long time to come. So how did uh, this come about, this final, I suppose, vengeance on these troublesome brethren, the Ephraimites? Well, it tells us in verse 4 that Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim, and the men of Gilead smote Ephraim, and then it says, because. Okay, so it's because of something that they said. And this is what they said. They said, ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among uh, the Manasites. And so what he was saying is basically you guys are a bunch of refugees. You're, you're, you're if we'd say today, maybe illegal immigrants, uh, you're, you're fugitives. You don't really belong. Uh, you don't fit in. You're renegades. Uh, that's, the, that's the accusation. And uh, you don't really belong here. Uh, you, you don't belong uh, in this land. Uh, you're, you're really illegals. You're, uh, you're, you're ir immigrants, whatever, and uh, refugees. And kind of uh, strong language that they're using, basically. And tragically, the tribes east of the Jordan River, Reuben, Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, had been granted their land by both Moses and Joshua. And so the words of the Ephraimites were an insult, not only uh, to the people, that uh, the, the men of Gilead, but they were an insult to the Lord and to his servants who had granted them this. Uh, and again, it showed uh, how divisive uh, these men of Ephraim were and how they quickly belittled uh, the, the Gileadites uh, to say that they're nothing but a bunch of immigrants. That's how they would say it, or illegals. Uh, that's how they are termed. And so as a result of that, it says that the men of Gilead, they fought with Ephraim, and the men of Gilead smote Ephraim. And I suppose one quick lesson we can learn is that uh, the men of Ephraim were better at talking the talk than they are at fighting. And it's interesting how sometimes people can be that way. Uh, they're all talk. Every time they show up after the battle and say, you should have included us, but when they really are brought to a fight, uh, it seems like they're defeated inc incredibly easily uh, by the men of Gilead, and they conquered them without any trouble. And so it seems like they were people who were all bluster, uh, lots of talk, but no real reality. And sometimes uh, the, that prideful spirit and that arrogance, it's all in the theoretical realm. You know, we're better than you. And yet it's, it's kind of armchair critics that don't know what it is to, to fight the battles, to, to be involved in conflict. But they're good at, at criticizing what others are doing and uh, causing strife, but actually don't do anything themselves. And so that's certainly the men of Ephraim uh, turned out to be pretty poor uh, when it came to the battle. And there's a little bit of a twist and a little bit of an irony here, because remember, they'd accused them of being these immigrants, renegades, fugitives, whatever uh, term you want to use. Uh, King James uses the word fugitives here. But in verse five, it says the Gileadites took the passage of Jordan, 
before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, now that word escaped is exactly the same word. Uh, those men of Ephraim that were fugitives or that were uh, illegals or whatever, uh, they escaped, said, let me go over. That the men of Gilead said unto him, art thou an Ephraimite? He said, nay. And so those that had escaped, uh, they had, in a sense, literally a twist in the language, they'd become renegades themselves because uh, the same word is used. And the Jordan, which should have been a point of unity, amongst the tribes, because they all crossed the Jordan together uh, in a united campaign <clears throat> under the leadership of Joshua, became a point of division and death. And how tragic that the thing that was meant to unite them became a thing that was divisive. And by the way, it's interesting that it mentions here these passages of Jordan, or the fords of Jordan. And it's actually the third time that we have that mentioned in the book of Judges. So it's obviously a very important place, the crossing point of the Jordan, where it could be forded easily, uh, a place where the, the two and a half tribes could cross over or the, uh, the remaining tribes on the other side could cross back. Uh, or, so obviously a very significant place. And we saw it early on in Judges in chapter 3 and verse 28, where, again, holding this fords of Jordan was very significant. And this is uh, during uh, the judgeship of Ehud. Uh, and it says in verse 28, he said unto them, follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemy, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. And so, again, it was keeping the enemy out, was a place of defense, uh, but the fords of Jordan. And then we saw it in uh, where the men of Ephraim themselves, uh, at Gideon's request, uh, they, uh, as it were, secured the fords of Jordan. In Judges 7, in verse 24, it says, Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters to Beth Bara and Jordan, and all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan, and they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock, Oreb and Zeb, they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side, Jordan. And so obviously these are these same fords where the Ephraimites themselves uh, had cut down the Midianites in chapter 7, but this time it's Jephthah's army that is slaughtering the Ephraimites who were trying to flee from the skillful Gileadite fighters. And so a test was given. If you like, the test of fellowship was being given here in verse 6. Then said they unto them, Say now, Shibboleth, and he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. So the test of fellowship was an issue of how you pronounce one word. And actually, when it boils down to it, it's one letter in one word. Right? It's the letter H. And they couldn't pronounce it right. And it was interesting. We were talking last night at the Bible study a little bit about accents and and uh, one of the people recognized uh, that my accent wasn't a typical American accent. And they noticed that certain letters I don't pronounce uh, like an American. And uh, it, it's interesting that, that one of them is the letter H. And I put the letter H where it doesn't belong sometimes, and I remove it where it should be, like the, the word house. And so just kind of interesting. Uh, I would probably not do very well crossing the fords of Jordan. Uh, <laughs> so uh, basically, this test of fellowship is how you pronounce a word. And it's interesting, isn't it, that often things that divide God's people are seemingly insignificant things, not really that significant. In fact, um, interesting test, when a nasty split occurs amongst God's people, I want to suggest to you that sometimes if you ask somebody five years afterwards, what was it all about? 
sometimes they'd be hard pressed to even tell you what the issues were. At the time, it seems to be uh, of great magnitude. <laughs> and, and yet five years down the pike, people can't even remember what it was. And so things that divide the people of God often are not significant things. And when a nasty split occurs several years later, the people just are so perplexed to be able to give you an answer, a straight answer of what it is all about. In this case, their pronunciation, like Peter's accent in Matthew 26, 73, uh, it gave them away. Remember, uh, his speech betrayed him. AMS Gooding, in his commentary, says they slew a man because he couldn't pronounce one letter right. And then he says that this, that is legality. And legality among the saints thousands of times since has slain fellow brethren and sisters because they couldn't say one word right. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? And there's lots of practical application here. Uh, I, I think sometimes uh, when a young brother, for instance, gets up at the Lord's Supper for the first time, and in his nervousness, he thanks the Father for dying on the cross to pay for our sins. Mind you, that's not just young brethren. Sometimes older brethren do that inadvertently, not intentionally, but they, they do. And, and how do we handle that? And sometimes some brethren will take a, a young man like that and they'll nail him to the wall with such severity that he'll never get on his feet again for the rest of his days. All because of nervousness and saying something with slight inaccuracy, forgetting the fact that every prayer goes through the divine editing process and is perfect before it reaches the throne of God. But sometimes we can be we can be so hot on some of these things. Now again, we need to be we need a balance. We need to be careful. Uh, because some words um, are important words, biblical words. But, we, but again, we need to exercise grace and not severity. And I think that's the important thing. Now, I want you to look at Romans chapter 12. And this is, again, as we think of brethren and how we, we deal with one another, how we relate to one another. Uh, we'll get some wonderful uh, exhortations in Romans 12. And again, it's in the context of the surrendered life, uh, the person who's presented their body, a living sacrifice, and, and how we, we, we then live within the, uh, having presented our body, we live within the wider body, uh, the body of Christ. And verse 16, it says, be of the same mind one toward another, Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And so we, we just have to be very careful about how we deal with our fellow brothers and sisters, and especially in the issue of words. One word would make all the difference between living and dying. Their destiny hinged on a single word and actually a single letter. Isn't that amazing? That people went into eternity because of one letter that they couldn't say correctly. And because of this story, the word shibboleth has become a part of our English vocabulary and now is found in our dictionaries, and it stands for any kind of test that a group gives to outsiders to see whether they really belong. And so if you want to be in fellowship with our group of assemblies, you have to say shibboleth the right way. And if you can't say shibboleth the right way, then you're not part of our circle of fellowship. And so usually the shibboleth is an old worn out idea or doctrine that is really not important. In Ephraim's case, however, it would cost 42,000 people their lives. With a loss of 42,000 men, Ephraim's military capabilities was virtually wiped out. They would never be a threat again 
uh, to the peace amongst God's people because they became insignificant uh, as a result of this. But in a sense, there is a practical gospel application I don't want us to miss here. And that is, there is a single word that will allow us to cross Jordan, if we want to use it in a spiritual sense, into the promise of eternity. And that's the word Lord. It's a very significant word. And again, I want to read from Romans chapter 10, just to bring home this, that, you know, in one sense, why should God let us into his heaven? What, what is the basis for that? How could we know that when the time for us to cross over, Romans 10, 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And again, we, we believe uh, that he is Lord. Uh, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so that, that name is, is so special, isn't it? Uh, to recognize that he's not just a good man. He's not just some moral teacher. Uh, that, uh, but, but it's to recognize who he is and his claims. And why should God let you into your, his heaven? Well, it's because we believe that Jesus is Lord. And of course, nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so it's, it's that idea of, of coming to that saving faith and knowing that he is Lord. That's what's going to make all the difference for our eternal crossing of, uh, as it were, Jordan uh, into uh, the paradise that awaits us. Notice verse 7, it says, And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Gilead. So Jephthah judged Israel six years. Six is the number of man in weakness. And Jephthah was a weak man in a time of great departure. And yet by the grace of God, he made it into Hebrews 11. And it was the shortest period recorded for a judge. And so of all the judges, the, the six is the shortest period anybody reigned. And yet there are many noteworthy characteristics. If we kind of want to summarize Jephthah's life, many noteworthy characteristics he brought. He brought certainly the Lord's deliverance to Israel uh, from a very real and vicious enemy. He was a decisive leader who was good with words and skilled in battle. He had a great knowledge of the scripture and acknowledgement of the Lord's hand in his life and the people, uh, <clears throat> the Lord's hand in his life and that of the people is undeniable. In fact, even Samuel recognized the contribution of Jephthah that he had made in 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 11. And again, this is fitting tribute uh, to Jephthah when uh, a man of the statute of Samuel mentions him. And so he says in 1 Samuel 12, verse 11, the Lord sent Jeroboam and Bedan and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelt safe. And so he even mentions him along with himself, uh, and so clearly in distinguished company. And of course, the Lord honors him in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. He nullified the considerable threat of the Ammonites and he confronted the pride of the Ephraimites. He was not a man who sought to evade the issues that needed to be addressed. And I, I think that's a very important thing, isn't it? That, um, that leadership is willing to deal with issues. Now, uh, as we say, he probably went overboard in his dealing uh, with Ephraim, but at least he, dealt, he did something. He, he didn't just allow them to continue on. He put an end to it. And so he dealt with the external enemy and he dealt with an internal threat to, to division. And he was a man who didn't ignore the issues. He dealt with the issues of the day. And sometimes in leadership, it's, it's easy, in a sense, to ignore a problem with the hope that it will disappear. But tragically, 
it doesn't disappear. In fact, usually it gets worse. And so at least he was willing to grasp the nettle and deal with issues. And for that, he is to be commended. So I feel like there are a lot of good things about Jephthah's leadership uh, that stand out in this account. So now we, we move from Jephthah and we move on to the judges that came after him. And there's three of them that are mentioned. But once again, we're, we're very scant on information. Notice it says in verse 8, and after him. And so it's placing emphasis on the, the, the leaders that succeeded him, uh, those that were his successors. And as we said, three judges are listed. And they judge for a period, these three judges of 25 years. And again, it would appear, just like uh, we saw with earlier with Tola, that during this period, uh, there's, there's no battles that are fought. There's, there's peace. It's, it's fragile because the Philistines are on the rise. And we're going to see that when we get to the, the, the next judge who gets a lengthy treatment, and that's Samson. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they maintain uh, peace for this considerable period of 25 years after the six years that Jephthah judged. And although there, there are some that like to put a negative spin on these next three judges, uh, particularly because of the size of families and various things like that, there's all sorts of ideas that they had many wives and different things like that. What's interesting is scripture is silent about it. It doesn't, doesn't give a negative uh, spin on their leadership at all. And so we need to be careful that we don't attribute something negative that scripture is not negative about. So when it comes to these men, Ibsen and Ellen and Abdon, that were given the barest amount of information. We're told where they're from, told a little bit about their family data, the years of judging, their death, their burial place. And sometimes our curiosity can get the better of us. And we, we feel a bit frustrated, like, Lord, what about these guys? Well, how come we got so much information on Gideon, so much information on Jephthah, and yet just a few lines on these judges? And I suppose that one of the things that we need to keep reminding ourselves is that the Bible is not man-centered. It's God-centered. <clears throat> so the focus is not so much on the life of man, but on God's action. And so we need to keep reminding ourselves this. This, is, this book is theocentric. It's not egocentric. It's not man-centered. Of course, it doesn't mean that man does not have a significant role. Surely he does. We believe that. But, but the point is that this book is a revelation of the divine person. And so if we had all the details of all the humans that we come across in the Bible and we got all their life stories, can you imagine even trying to carry your Bible to the meeting? It would be impossible, wouldn't it? I mean, it, it, sometimes it just overlooks individuals. But it doesn't want us to overlook who the Lord is. Behold your God is the primary message that we need to see. And we need to be content with that and content with what it does tell us about these individuals. Now, of course, one of the great contrasts that we'll observe is that, <coughs> excuse me, in the case of Jephthah, we know that he had one daughter and basically uh, she lived a life of perpetual devotion and therefore had no children and she bewailed her virginity and so basically one child and that's the end of it uh, no further offspring but when we can trust with some of these uh, that followed afterwards we see the very opposite and we see that they had large families and so we begin with uh, this first one, verse 8, it says, After him, Ibsen of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons. And so what a contrast between one daughter that did not have any children to 30 sons. 
30 sons and 30 daughters. So talk about prolific. Whom he sent abroad and took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons, and he judged Israel seven years. Now, again, all we know is he had a large family, 30 sons, 30 daughters. He sent them abroad. And so the, the thought is that perhaps there were alliances made through marriage within different tribal groupings. And as a result of that, there was peace during this man's reign. This man is the 10th judge of Israel. His city is stated to be Bethlehem. And again, we're not certain. Is it Bethlehem of Judah or Bethlehem in Zebulun? Uh, we already have Zebulun mentioned uh, in connection with Elon. So could it be that two of these judges were from the same region? Uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, but <clears throat> the two Bethlehems, usually when it's Bethlehem in the south in Judah, it usually states it. And so many have thought that it was Bethlehem in Zebulun. And again, the only personal details we get is he judged Israel seven years, he died, was buried in his native place. Obviously, um, that during that seven years when he judged Israel, uh, he obviously had reached a level of maturity when he began to judge uh, because he had 30 sons and the same number of daughters. And so this idea of sending them abroad was uh, the idea of uh, making alliances among the tribes. Uh, and again, as a result of it, maintaining peace. Now, one interesting twist on Ibzan, and I'm just going to mention this because uh, we can't be dogmatic about it, but uh, Jewish tradition would identify Ibzan with Boaz of Bethlehem, Judah. Kind of interesting. Now, again, I who knows what to think about Jewish tradition, but that's that's the connection they make. They believe that he is the same person as Boaz of Bethlehem, Judah. And although that seems hardly likely uh, when you consider the book of Ruth, and I would doubt it very much. But anyway, that's their take on the matter. And then verse 11, it says, after him, Elon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel, and he judged Israel 10 years, and Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried in Aijalon in the country of Zebulun. Now, again, all we know about this man, we don't even know about his family. So you talk about the scantest details. Elon, we know the name Elon means strength, and Aijalon means stag. It's a, a graceful stag. And so the picture is uh, strength and stag. And just as the stag is strong and yet graceful in its movements, it's been suggested this is a picture of Elon's leadership. It would have required both strength of character and a measure of grace to rule Israel in such turbulent times and to do it for 10 years. And again, in that 10 year period, there's no conflict, either internal or external. It's a time of peace. And so again, and again, I think it's good just, to, I think for myself, it struck me that it makes us thankful when we have a period in assembly life where we have godly, stable leadership. And we may not be involved in huge battles, but nevertheless, there's a stability and a peace among the saints that lasts. And that's something to be really thankful for. And how we should praise the Lord for, you know, that, okay, we may not be, you know, kind of in the midst of taking the fight to the enemy, but we're keeping the fight from within. And there's peace amongst the saints, and there is a tranquility, and that is something uh, to be commended. And certainly, Elon uh, was able to maintain 10 years of his judgeship without any recorded conflict or difficulty, and during that period, with strength and grace, he maintained his judgeship. And then we come to the final one in this little grouping. Uh, after him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, a Pirathonite, judged Israel, 
and he had 40 sons, 30 nephews, and rode on three score and 10 ass colts and judged Israel for eight years. And again, uh, the word Abdon, it means service. And it tells us that he's the son of Hillel, which means praises. Could it be that true service, Abdon the servant, springs from a heart of praise? And so he, he from a heart of praise, he serves. And during that judgeship, he serves for 10 years. And of course, we've observed before about riding on, on these ass colts, that it's a symbolic of peace. And so his uh, sons, 40 sons and, uh, and 30 nephews uh, ride on these colts, perhaps sharing uh, in the responsibility of maintaining peace with him. And, uh, and he uh, uses them well, as it were, to maintain a peaceful environment for a further eight years. And he tells us about his place uh, that he's from, Pirithon. And uh, it's famous for one other uh, person in scripture uh, that we know of who is from this area of Pirithon. And if you look at First Chronicles, uh, you're going to see that a very significant individual would come from here. First Chronicles 11, verse 31. It says, Ittai, the son of Rebel of Gibeah, that pertained to the children of Benjamin. And then it says, Beniah, the Pirithonite. And then again, if you look at First Chronicles 27, First Chronicles 27 and verse 14, you read this. The 11th captain for the 11th month was Beniah, the Pirithonite of the children of Ephraim, and in his course were 20 and 4,000. And so uh, Benaiah, one of David's mighty men, was from that same location of Pirithon, uh, where uh, this Abdon judged for that eight-year period. And so basically, we following the tumultuous times uh, that were experienced under uh, the reign of Jephthah, we have three very little detail judges, but we know that they were able to combine to maintain peace for 25 years, and there's a peaceful situation, which is something to be prized and highly valued. So now we come to chapter 13, and we're going to begin the life of Sonny, or Samson. And I want you to notice, uh, as we introduce this passage uh, I want to notice there's something different about this last of the saviors in the book of Judges. There's some unique features of his judgeship. He certainly pictures for us, I believe, conditions in the last of the last days. Okay, well, so we're going to kind of, this is the last of the last days of the book of Judges, and it's going to give you a little bit of a picture of the conditions. Samson as an individual, begins to bring deliverance, but he never leads an army, as in previous instances. So if you remember, in the previous instances, usually the judge is raised up by God, and then the people follow the judge. And so there's a deliverance. Certainly the judge is the leader, but he's not doing that on his own. The people are with him. They're supportive of him. They follow him. And, uh, and they, uh, as it were, emulate his courage and they win great victories. But in the case of Samson, it almost seems like this is a, a one-man war against the Philistines. No, they, they don't support him at all. It, it's, it's, and the picture is this, and it's kind of interesting. It's like 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy is individual faithfulness in a time of corporate failure. When all around, everybody's failed, here's Paul's word to Timothy, but thou, <laughs> you be different. You, you, be, you stand alone, even if it's just you. And that's what you find with Samson. It's down to the individual now. 
it's like Laodicea, where the Lord is knocking and he says, if any one hears my voice, if any man hears my voice and comes, I will sup with him. You know, again, the, the idea is that the corporate has gone so bad that it's only individuals now that are hearing God's voice, that are listening to him. And so the corporate picture is bleak and the Lord is appealing to the individual to fellowship with him. And so there could be no national deliverance during the time of Samson because there's no national repentance. There's just indifference. They don't even respond to the judge. In fact, they do respond to the judge, but they, they, they say, why are you causing us all this trouble? Uh, they, they don't follow his leadership. They actually want to hand him over to the enemy and say, you're, you're disturbing our peace. Don't you realize that we're subject to the Philistines? And so what we find is a people, when we get to Samson's judgeship, a people who are so used to sin and bondage that they thought it was normal. And they thought that the possibility of deliverance from that was abnormal and foreign. And so that's how pretty bleak it's going to be. Also, he is the first judge that ends up in the hands of the enemy and needs deliverance himself. All the other judges without difficulty conquer the enemy and yet in this case and we remember how we're going to find samson he's going to be held captive uh, in the temple of the philistine god and so he's the first judge that ends up in the hands of the enemy and needs delivering himself there were in the hands of the philistines for 40 years this is the longest recorded period of servitude notice again verse one the children of israel did evil again in the sight of the lord and the lord delivered them into the hand of the philistines 40 years and so the longest period of servitude recorded in the book and yet the amazing thing is they don't cry out for deliverance even after 40 years they reached a new low in that they didn't cry out for deliverance. And as we've already mentioned, they even got upset with Samson for fighting against the enemy and causing trouble for them. Uh, and I guess we could just take a quick peek at that in chapter 15 and verse 11. Chapter 15, verse 11 says, Then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock, Etam, and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, as they did unto me, so have I done unto them. And so, again, talk about complacency about them. They were in a terrible condition. They, <clears throat> they felt like anybody who was trying to bring it back to the way, way it used to be was a threat to them. And they didn't seem to care or yearn for anything better. They had just become resigned to bondage. By the way, that's a very dangerous place to become, isn't it? To, to get to the place where you're so used to defeat, you're so used to failure, you're so used to bondage that you just assume this is normal. And anybody even comes around, suggests that you might get free, is considered to be a threat, you know, don't disturb us, we, we like this, uh, we're content with, uh, and used to it, used to this situation of defeat, and that is exactly what we're going to find in this chapter. The other interesting thing about the judgeship of Samuel, uh, of Samson, is there was no person alive suitable for the Lord to raise up to deliver Israel. Samson was not yet born, and they had, had to wait for him to grow to maturity before deliverance could begin to take place. And so, again, we see there's some very striking things about this judgeship that separate it from other judgeships. So as we dive into this chapter, <clears throat> I want you to notice 
by now the familiar refrain. After these uh, judgeships that we've just observed, it says, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Now, again, just it's a good exercise just to see it because I know we've done it before, but it's just good to see this pattern that is found in this book. Chapter 2, verse 11. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Chapter 3 in verse 7. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. Chapter 3, verse 12. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 4 and verse 1. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. Chapter 6 and verse 1. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Chapter 10 and verse 6. It says, The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the children of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord and served him not. And once again, in chapter 13 and verse 1, we get the same old story. But as we've noted above, this time they did not cry out nor yearn for deliverance. The evil was at a greater level than previously in that they, they didn't cry out. Uh, and again, we do, can we see this consistent pattern of man's heart is constantly away from God? And of course, we've got to learn from it because our heart is no different. Our tendency, our tendency is to move away from God and to get involved in wrong things and wrong thinking and wrong ways. And that's just our natural tendency. And so they certainly were doing that. And so it says the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. And again, God never allows the enemy to gain power over us unless it's a judicial result of our own failure. In other words, it's only when they had turned away that the Lord hands them over to the enemy. And so, again, the, the enemy never gains a power over us unless it's a judicial result of our own failure. The weakest believer will be kept from the wiles and power of the enemy as long as the heart is true and loyal to Christ. We must not give place to the devil. And that's what they did. They gave place to the devil, giving a doorway of opportunity. And they did that. So again, who were these Philistines? We, we, we know that they're going to be a major player now from the rest of our way through the, the books of First and Second Samuel. And again, we need to just recognize who they are. We've already said, we've, we've seen the different enemies of Israel are representative of um, the spiritual enemies of us today. And so we saw that Amalek, Amalek is a consistent type of the flesh. A Midian was a type of strife. And we, we certainly see here that the Philistines, um, who do they represent? Well, it's interesting that <clears throat> their descendants of Ham, uh, we know a little bit about them. Uh, let's look back at Genesis chapter 10. Genesis 10 and the table of the nations, as we try to understand these characters, the Philistines. And verse 6, it says, In the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim, and Foot and Canaan. Now, Mizraim, one of the sons of Ham, it was through him that the Philistines come. Look at verse 13 now of Genesis 10. And Mizraim begat Ludim and Anamim and Lehabim and Naphtahim and Pathrusim and Kasluhim, and out of whom came Philistine 
and Kaphtorim. So descendants of Ham, and this is who the Philistines come through, through Mizraim, and this is where they appear on the scene of scripture in verse 14 of Genesis chapter 10. So how did they end up in the land of Canaan? Just as Israel had done so through Egypt, well, so did the Philistines. Many believe that they were seafaring people from the Mediterranean, perhaps from, from Greece, uh, that area, and they went up into Egypt and then they came down, but they didn't come the same way the nation of Israel came. They didn't come as redeemed by the Passover lamb. They didn't cross the Red Sea supernaturally. They didn't cross Jordan by supernatural means. They, they settled on the west coast of Canaan in the territory of the Israelites. And so they're amongst the people of God. They, they certainly have come into the land but they have not had any of the spiritual experiences that the nation of Israel have, ha have had. And of course, we know that they take up the five cities of Gaza, uh, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. Well, those five cities known, known today as the Gaza Strip. So that's where these people are. They're amongst God's people, but they, they, they've not had God's the experience, the same experience as the people of God. And I want to suggest to you, they picture for us those among the people of God who have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. They're amongst the sphere of Christian profession. They're, they're amongst the saints, but they've not experienced redemption by blood they've not experienced uh, the idea of of being united to christ in his death bell and resurrection they've not experienced any of those things and so they're people that we would call christendom they would be the modern day philistines they don't put any value on the blood of christ they don't put any value on the supernatural experience but they they're amongst god's people and so they're always sapping the people of God of their strength. And recently I did a series on the wells of scripture. And one of the things that the Philistines were always doing in the days of Isaac was filling up the wells. Uh, they don't like the word of God and the spirit of God working. You know, they'll do everything they can to shut those things down. And so they're a type of Christendom. They worship Dagon and they were sometimes there was something, as we might say, very fishy about them. Uh, they worship this fish god, half fish, half man. And, um, of course, uh, as, as well as the fertility goddess, Ashtaroth, uh, and they resemble the tares that are sown among the wheat of the people of God, seeking to drag the people down as they have different appetites and different values and that's exactly who these people were. And so into this scene that we find ourselves in, God is about to step in and begin to do something. And he's going to do something with the people who are not supernatural, uh, the Philistines. He's going to bring a supernatural birth into the situation that is going to bring a change in the whole scene. And that introduction... <clears throat> is going to be the miraculous birth of Samson. But we will have to, I believe, leave that uh, to a further study in a couple of weeks' time. And so <clears throat> this is a good place to end. And may the Lord help us not to follow the Israelites in their constant waywardness. Uh, what a verse to end on. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, even after a period of peace, period of tranquility, a period with no enemy attacking them. But they got complacent, they got comfortable, and they departed from the Lord. May the Lord help us to cleave faithfully to him today and each day, because we need to walk humbly with our God. Amen.